Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I have touch. Please, I'll quiet, please. Thank you. All right, so here we've got the last video presentation for this semester. It's been weird. So um, I'm going to cover a couple of things uh, before we get into the notes. Um, just posted um, grades for the history IAs for first draft. Um, and uh, way to go. It was not easy to do that under the circumstances. And I really appreciate um, strong effort that many of you guys put forth in your first draft, uh, which really, really, you know, is going to help a lot as you move forward on this. Um, I'm going to, I'll, I'll put some more in the Google Classroom. I'll pick it out and write it all out for you and so forth. But um, the final draft ultimately is going to be due end of first semester, senior year. So we've got still, everybody um, has work to do on it and uh, there's still the summertime and I would say as libraries come open if BSU library comes open other local libraries um, just maybe not having the crush of lots of other assignments and so forth going on use that time to uh, really improve and some of you know that there is improvement that can definitely be made <clears throat> as far as like research and writing and getting additional sources better sources uh, so use that time I know it was tough uh, this semester or typically um, when students do their first draft, uh, we have some time in class. Everyone gets to get get together and uh, uh, does like some peer review, um, particularly to uh, catch some of the like the really obvious, like typos and things like that. <clears throat> so I would like to have that take place early in the first semester um, and have everybody submit um, a revised um, a version. Uh, some definitely are going to need to like do that because before I sit down and have a um, an official meeting with everybody on their on their history IA, um, it needs to be in good shape because I only get one meeting. So um, keep that in mind. Um, also, um, for some, definitely look very carefully again at the the criteria and how it's set up. Uh, there's three different sections, and each of them needs to have their their proper headings, um, you know, and I'll put this in the Google Classroom just as a reminder to you, but suffice it to say, we're going to come right back to it first thing, first semester, um, and get like revised versions in. Some might have a lot of revisions that will need to come in. Others, maybe not so much. If you, did, if you got a really good grade, you're probably not going to have as much uh, before we have our meeting. So anyway, Way to go on your first go around at the History IA. Okay, let's turn our attention to um, your notes. This is the last of the notes. And it's always very interesting because like um, IB has got all these different things going on. We've got, um, in, in the packet we've got Cold War part one of three. Um, I mean, it's this big, big thing. And the Cold War, of course, is a paper two topic. Very important paper two topic. And we cover it three different units. <laughs> in the midst of that, um, there's also these paper three topics, right? Cold War in the Americas, right? So we're going to be looking at that and we'll actually give you some notes on that. So if you look at, say, for example, the top of page two, um, Cold War in the Americas, um, we're gonna, we've gone through a lot of that as we've gone through the presentations. I am going to be focusing on some particular things in the notes here today, okay? We'll also see like, for example, beginning of next semester, and this is kind of where we were actually with the current seniors. They started off the school year doing the India, Indo-Pakistan Wars and the Algerian Wars. We'll start that beginning of next semester. So don't worry about that, we haven't gotten to that. Um, those are paper two topics, 20th century wars, okay? But if you flip back over to page one, you can see these various different components that are in the Cold War, Paper 2, Topic 12. Um, that's how they've got them spelled out, and we get them as we go through, okay? And I think it's very helpful. Um, you guys have obviously looked at Page 3, CNN Cold War, and that's a pretty good video series that we've linked on to to build our notes around and to build our instruction around as we go forward, okay? So... What I want to start with today, then, as far as the notes go, is let's get right to this. Okay, here we go, off in the corner. If you look on page one, 
Um, near the very bottom, right, you got the detailed study, uh, wartime conferences, cover those. Harry Truman and Joseph Stalin, got those. Next bullet point, U.S. policies development in Europe, so forth, got, got those. Soviet policies, got that. Germany, East, especially Berlin, mm, yeah, <laughs> okay. Middle East and the Cold War, let's get to that. Middle East and the Cold War, um, that's what I want to focus on, because that doesn't come up so much at this time in the CNN uh, videos. Um, I mean, they're great. It's massive, massive, extensive piece. But I want to really, really kind of hone in on those. And then we'll turn our attention to page two, Cold War in the Americas, and we'll go right through that. And that will wrap us up. All right, cool. So you guys are ready? Let me find my place in my notes here. There we go. All right. The Middle East. It's a very important place. I mean, there's so many places in the cold and uh, world that are going to be affected by the Cold War. The Americas, I mean, the Far East, the Pacific, I mean, Africa, all these different places. But I tell you what, the Middle East gets a lot of attention during the Cold War, in particular, because of several reasons. One, it is a very strategically important place. It's right by Asia. It's where Africa, Asia, and uh, Europe come together. There are important trade routes that go through the Middle East. Control of the Middle East is very, very important. The United States and its allies and the Soviet Union are going to be making great strides to have influence in the Middle East. And there will be opportunities and conflicts between those various sides. It's a fascinating story about how this actually plays out. Okay? Another reason why the Middle East is so important, because it is the location of a high percentage of, our, of the oil energy resources that are available in the world. Okay? In fact, it was fascinating because by the time we get to um, the, uh, the wars um, that take place, you know, the Persian Gulf War in uh, 1990, 1991, and so forth, uh, we're going to see that you know, some people are like, why are we going to war? Why is the United States going to war? Is it all about oil? Well, it's partly about oil, although today the United States produces an awful lot of oil, and there are other oil producers elsewhere. But keep that in mind, because I remember in the 1970s, there was a war in the Middle East, and the United States took sides, as we often will, Israel versus uh, many of its Arab neighbors. And many of the Arab neighbors are like, man, we're not really happy with the United States. And they cut off oil supplies. And so we had long gasoline, long, long lines at the gas stations because there was not enough gasoline um, available for the United States energy market. So anyway, let's keep an eye on that. All right, so let's start off. First of all, what was the scoop in the Middle East um, as World War II was over? Well, if, as you recall, all right, okay, so look at the map here. We got lots of oil right here. Sorry, I just, I'm looking at the map here and just want to point this out. Right here is the country that has created Kuwait. Lots of oil there, lots of oil in Iran, in Iraq. Those are going to be oil rich countries. Saudi Arabia has got a lot of oil as well as the smaller nations of the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Bahrain, Oman. This whole Persian Gulf area has got so much oil in it. Some of them, not so much, like Syria, Turkey, Jordan. Egypt? Mm, no, not much oil there. But the other ones, mm -hmm. oil-rich uh, economies. Okay, back to it. At the end of World War II, um, you're going to start seeing some new countries coming into existence. Now, remember, you know, if you go back to World War I, you know, all of this was controlled by Turkey, and the Turkey lost World War I, so you had new countries created, Arab countries, um, the United Arab Emirates, and Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait, and so forth. But, um, you know, Britain had been in charge of what would ultimately become Jordan, Israel, Iraq. Um, Syria in charge of, uh, excuse me, France in charge of Syria, Lebanon, okay? Oh, and excuse me, Iraq was under the French control as well. This was the mandates that was, you know, supposedly under the uh, auspices of the League of Nations. Anyway, the British and the French, by the end of World War II, there are a lot of folks in this region saying, uh, Britain, France, can you, like, go? Could we be independent countries? This is one of the main things that we see as we go forward when we get to Indo, uh, India and Pakistan coming into independence. There's a lot of pressure um, 
from all kinds of different places for imperialism to like go. You know, the Philippines are going to be independent from the United States. All kinds of different countries are going to gain their independence in Asia and Africa throughout the late 1940s and into the 50s and into the 60s, right? So one of the key questions then has to do this area right around here, right? Syria gets its independence. Libya gets its, excuse me, Lebanon gets its independence. But what about right here? The territory was known as Palestine. It was under British mandate, right? So the British were in charge of it um, from the time of the end of World War I, um, when the Turks got kicked out. And the British are like, well, what do we do with it? What do we do with it? What do we do with it? Well, at the end of World War uh, II, British are like, um, we want to get out of here. I mean, seriously, we want to get out of here. And you had various different people that were in the area that wanted various different outcomes, okay? As far as who was going to be in charge, you're going to have one big state here. Was it going to be democracy? How is it going to play out? And so forth. Okay. Now, an interesting thing had been occurring in this region throughout the first half of the 20th century, right? Especially after the British gained control of it after World War I. That is, you had a number of people from Europe, Jews, who had moved there and had purchased land. And they had in their minds the idea that they were coming home. Now, if you look at the long history of Jews throughout a long, long period of history, I mean, there was an Israeli kingdom a long, long time ago, and you had diasporas, meaning, you know, the Jewish people were spread and moved to all various different areas, which is why you have so many Jews living in Europe. But there was a feeling in Europe, um, this idea of Zionism and so forth, like, let's go to a place where we can call our home you know, an ancient place we can call our home. So anyway, you had a lot of Jews moving into that region, particularly right along here around Jerusalem and along the coast and so forth during the time of the British uh, mandate, the British occupation of this Palestine area, okay? Arabs were, you know, they were like, uh, you know, like, wow. Because you know, previously there's lots and lots and lots of Arabs in that area. I mean, they've been there for a long, long time. And so, you know, now the British have this issue because a lot of the Jews are arguing for, hey, we want a state. We want a country. All right. Uh, we took it on the chin pretty bad during World War II. I mean, remember the Holocaust and so forth? And in fact, there were, if you had survived the Holocaust in Europe, many of those folks are now moving to this area after World War II. And they're putting pressure on the British and so forth to uh, like, you know, hey, can you create an independent like Israel, Israel for us, you know, taking the name of of the uh, of the kingdom during you know way way back during the time of david and solomon and so forth of course the british are like i don't know i don't know what, what should we do is is there an international organization that is kind of kind of in charge of these sorts of things oh the united nations hmm, interesting of course what is the most important leader in the free world well the united states what is the united states position what is the united nations you know a view of all these various different countries what is their view on creating a separate Israel as opposed to you know, a larger country here, which would be, I don't know, Palestine or Jordan Palestine, who knows what. Um, in any event, the United States, under the leadership of President Truman, was very supportive of the creation of Israel. Okay. And with that leadership um, in the United Nations, the United States um, recognized the state of Israel on May 14th, 1948. And the United Nations went along with that, okay? As we'll see, there is going to be a split. Guess which country in the United Nations Israel is going to be most close to in the years going forward? Soviet Union or the United States? Not even close, the United States, okay? Those who oppose the creation of Israel and its continued existence and so forth, and and during its fights and so forth, because there's going to be quite a few more wars. Soviet Union is going to be very supportive of some of the um, Arab countries that are going to be in conflict with Israel. So we're going to get a lot of details of those various different conflicts. Curiously enough, by the time you end, end up in like the 1980s, from the 1970s into the 1980s, we'll see this next year, the United States is not only like an ally of Israel, but also an ally of at least two of the Arab countries, Jordan and Egypt. And that's an interesting story, how that plays out, how they're kind of taken from the Soviet orbit 
and come over to the United States. Um, so it's, you know, it, it's going to be an interesting thing. I mean, what does it take for the United States to, uh, like, get Arab countries to no longer be buddy-buddy with the Soviets and now, you know, friends with the United States? In cash? <laughs> Something to do with it. Anyway, it's a fascinating story. Let's take a look here as we play this out because, surprise, surprise, when Israel declares its independence and the United States recognizes it and, this, and uh, United Nations recognizes it, boom, there's war. Immediately there is war, okay? Um, the Arab states that are around it, to the north, Lebanon, to the, uh, to the east, um, Jordan, to the north, east, Syria, to the west, Egypt, with support from other Arab nations and so forth, um, are going to be coming right after Israel. Okay, let's just take a look at this map just to get a sense and, and back it up here. So there you go, 1946, this is right after World War II. Um, land controlled by Jews, uh, pretty much uh, having been purchased from Jews that had moved into that area. <clears throat> As part of the partition plan from the United Nations and Britain's like, oh yeah, fine, that looks good and so forth. <coughs> you take areas that the Jews have a lot of population right here, right? Tel Aviv and Haifa and so forth. And that's gonna be the new state of Israel, right? Well, the Arabs aren't very happy with that. So they're not really keen about that. So there is a war. Well, what happens in the war? Well, Israel is not wiped out. In fact, Israel fights back. And as you can see right here in this map, you'll see Israel gains control of parts of Jerusalem, right? And expands it. I mean, it's still a fairly small state here and it expands it right here. And so this area is going to be sometimes referred to as the West Bank, okay? And then right over here, you have Gaza. Those are areas where you have higher percentage population of Arab uh, Palestinians, many of them Muslim, some Christian, but most of them Muslim, okay? So that's the result of that. Now, if you go to this map right now, and you're looking at it, it's like, well, what happened? As a result of several wars, I mean, here's the thing, simple thing to remember. Lots of wars between Israel and its neighbors, Israel doesn't lose any of them. And in fact, is going to gain a lot of territory. Although some of that territory will be returned, for example, to Egypt in exchange for recognition and peace and you know good terms and so forth. So that's why Israel is on good terms with Jordan and Egypt today, because you know land was returned and, and peaceful objectives and the United States was like, yeah, there's a little money. <laughs> Okay, all right, there is a map of um, kind of how things played out in that first, what they call the War of Independence, um, you know, 1948, when Israel uh, was at war with all of its Arab neighbors, but they were able to fight back successfully and win that particular war, okay? As things play out, it's very fascinating because let's turn our attention over to Egypt, okay? Egypt, which had been under like, quasi-dominance from the British for so, so, so many years. But of course now Britain is kind of like, okay, we're gonna get out of here <clears throat> after World War II. You know, we're not gonna be the big imperial foe. <clears throat> Although we do want to maintain control over the very important strategic asset, the Suez Canal. All right, to see the Suez Canal here, which the British built in the 1800s. And it connects the Mediterranean Sea with the Gulf of Suez, which flows out into the Red Sea, which flows out into the Indian Ocean. It's a very, very important route for transit of goods and ships and military things, and the British want to hang on to it, okay? But the Egyptians are thinking, hey, we're not that keen on the British controlling like the main source of, you know, one of the main sources of, you know, economic well-being in the country of Egypt. And so there's going to be some tension there. And, you know, the new Egyptian government is going to be putting some pressure, particularly this man right here. Make sure you have his name down there. Um, because he's very well known throughout the Middle East and, and you know, cheered on by Arab uh, peoples outside of Egypt as well as in Egypt, right? Um, his name is Gabo, uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser, Nasser okay? And he is, the, he is the leader of Egypt during this time period and all the way from the 1950s. And you can see it's interesting because he's, you can kind of sometimes you get a lot of a lot of uh, information out of pictures, right? So it looks like a kind of a friendly picture. There's our United States president here in the 1950s with President uh, Nasser because the United States wants to have positive relations with Egypt. 
and ultimately we will. It's going to take until the time of Nixon. So we got some things going on before we'll get that. But President Eisenhower is interested in positive relations with Egypt because Egypt, you know, if they come down, you know, pro-Soviet or whatever. I mean, part of it is like um, economic opportunities, you know, or access to various different strategic kinds of things. We, there was a lot of reason why the United States wants to be in good terms with Egypt. And Egypt is going to decide what the terms are, right? For example, one. Egypt is looking, let's go back right here. Uh, I can't really tell, but uh, there's a Nile River over here and it flows, you know, it's, it, it, or its origins are way, 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 way south, south of its borders and so forth. And the Egyptians are interested in building a dam along the uh, Nile River for flood control and, you know, for various different reasons. And, you know, they're looking for expertise, you know, I don't know, maybe the Americans could provide that. Maybe that would be a good contract opportunity for the Americans. I don't know, is there anybody else that Nasser is considering? Oh, those guys. <laughs> yeah, Khrushchev is trying to be all buddy-buddy with Nasser, too. Nasser is like clever. He's trying to play one off the other, you know, Khrushchev and the Soviet Union versus the United States and so forth. And this is all taking place in the context of, um, you know, the 1950s. Okay. All right. So we've actually already kind of sort of alluded to what takes place in 1956. Remember with the Hungarian situation in 1956 with the Hungarians? under Naj or like, hey, we want to be like, you know, free of the Soviets. And so they're having their whole thing there going on and violence and in Budapest. And then the world's attention, ooh, squirrel. Um, what's going on in the Suez? What's going on in Egypt? Well, what is going on in Egypt? Well, Nasser, you know, he's buddy buddies talking to Khrushchev and talking to Eisenhower, but what about the British, right? Well, here it is. Take a look at the map. The British and the French, and Israel don't respond very well when Nasser, on July 26, 1956, nationalizes the Suez Canal. I mean, he's tired of negotiating with the British and so forth. He says, we're just gonna take it. So they do, the Egyptians take it. And then the British and French and the Israelis are like, no, you're not. And they send in paratroopers and they take it back. So, you know, Nasser loses, except, now, President Eisenhower steps in and goes, hey, Britain, hey, France, it's not the imperial time anymore. This is not like when you guys were like the head of the world. You need to mind your position now. We, it's a tough thing to say, we are the leaders of this alliance. We have the strongest economy. We have the strongest military. Remember, who gets most of the credit? Uh, between the three, Britain, France, and the United States for victory in World War II. Who's going to be the leader carrying us out forward on this one? Very difficult. It's kind of like someday, you know, who's in charge now? Who has more authority now on the basis of whatever? Parents? You. Over time, is that ever going to shift? Mm, that's an interesting conversation when you start telling your parents what to do. Mm. Um, so, yeah, here's the United States, Eisenhower, telling Britain in France, and by the way, Israel, you have to get out of Egypt. They didn't want to hear it. They, that was embarrassing. It was a very embarrassing thing because the uh, British and the French did it without really consulting with the United States. And if they had the United States, Eisenhower would have said, mm, this is not going to be good for us in the long run. So the British and the French got out. Israel got out. And who got the Suez Canal? Nasser did. Egypt did. All right? Who got to build the Aswan Dam? The Soviets. <laughs> Soviets. And in fact, put that down. Um, Egypt will be close to the Soviets. The Soviets will be supplying military um, equipment and um, various different advisors and so forth. Keep an eye on that one because Egypt is going to go to war with Israel at least two more times. And one of the questions that the Egyptians are going to be asking is, is the Soviet equipment good versus the, what well, I don't know, where's Israel getting their equipment from? The United States. So keep an eye on that one, because it's, it's an interesting opportunity for the United States and the Soviets as to use these proxies sort of to test their equipment in real, you know, warlike situations. Okay. So, <clears throat> so we have the Suez crisis is, is finished. The British, you know, they got Soviet, Soviet troops potentially could have jumped in there. And America was like, oh, come on, man, we don't want the we don't want the British and the French to be fighting the Soviets. That's not good. So anyway, moving on. 
let's go turn our attention and we'll be talking more and more about the, uh, the Middle East later on as we go through the Cold War. It's very, very interesting. It's still very interesting. All right, now turn your attention to uh, page two at the top there. If you look at the Cold War in the Americas, the paper three topic, a lot of those things have actually been covered a fair amount, right? President Truman and containment policy, McCarthyism um, has been covered very, very well. The Cold War's impact on society and culture. Yeah, we've gotten a lot of that. Korean War, okay? So what I want to talk to you about, though, is some various different things that have taken place um, with respect to uh, things that haven't come up yet, all right? So let's, let's look at that. In the Americas, after World War II, What is the United States attitude toward the Americas? Well, remember, if you, if you think back to before World War II, remember uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt was like, hey, you know, we're going to be the good neighbor and we're not going to bug you <laughs> anymore. You know, do your thing. In world, during the Cold, the world War II, we were like, you know, you definitely can't be allied with the, the Germans. And, and a lot of those countries are like, don't worry, you know. We can't trade with the Germans because the British have got an effective naval blockade on the Atlantic Ocean. Well, after World War II, during the Cold War, the United States is going to be very, very interested in, in how these things play out, okay? How, who is in charge? What kind of government is in charge in various different um, American countries, particularly the ones in Central America, because they're closer to the United States, but also in South America. And we're very, very interested in what the ideology is, and what the relationships that those governments have with the Soviet Union. And if they're to the left, is that okay? Or is that a danger? Is that an opening for communism and therefore Soviet influence? And anyway, think of it this way. During the Cold War, a lot of times the United States and others put on glasses, our Cold War glasses. We see events and things through the medium of how does this impact the Cold War balance of power? I mean, like, so if some Central American country all of a sudden elects like a far left government, I mean, do we, can we just sit back and go, eh, whatever, that's what those people want? Or are we like, ah, oh, no, next thing we know, we're gonna have Soviet troops in there, da, 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 da. I mean, like, what's the worst thing that can happen? Like, I don't know, Cuba ends up having a you know, far left government, and what's like this, Soviets are gonna put nuclear weapons on those and point them at the United States? So these are the kinds of things that we'll be looking at. We'll fill in the details as we go along. Now, first of all, in 19, April 1948, we have a new organization created, the Organization of American States, okay, for regional peace and security. Well, the United States is like, well, that's a nice, really, organization, and everyone gets to be, look at all those lovely flags that are in there, but you know what? <laughs> if we have anything to say about it, and we are a big country, we're the biggest in the Americas, uh, we would like it to be anti-communist. Of course, most of those countries are like, oh my gosh, here we go, Uncle Sam. Mm -hmm. Now it's the anti-communist thing. They generally don't want the United States to intervene. And that's the general attitude. Um, but watch out, okay? One thing, of course, we're always looking at in the United States is, is communism, and particularly Soviet communism, is it making its way into Latin American countries, okay? It had... Um, at the end of World War II, the largest communist party was in Chile, and um, but it got banned after the 1946 election. Keep an eye on Chile later on. We'll see leftist parties do quite well in the United States, be like, uh, potentially intervening in a way in Chile. One of the things the United States does um, to um, we've talked about this before, is the uh, Security Council, um, National Security Council that was created by con an act of Congress, um, the National Security Act. We talked about this before, creating and the opportunity of uh, the CIA to intervene, you know, whether you talk about Italian elections, well, we'll see there's going to be a fair amount of different levels of intervention going on in the Americas as well. We're concerned about the spread of communism, okay? And so, you know, what could we do in order to influence events and we've done this before and we'll be doing it in different ways again during the cold war okay um here's an interesting thing um speaking of as far as like uh communism um we added under god one nation under god was added to the pledge of allegiance 
pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. This was added in 1948, right? One nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. You think there's a reason why this was added during the Cold War where the main opponent is atheistic communist Soviet Union? Mm, yeah. So yeah, there's that idea and that has been part of the, uh, uh, the Pledge of Allegiance confirmed by Congress in 1954. Um, yeah, so taking sides on that particular issue. And some of you guys may recall in government classes, like, is that a violation of the First Amendment establishment clause? Hmm. Has the Supreme Court ever ruled on that? Have they ever had a case on that? Yeah, remember they kicked it out because the people who were bringing the case, uh, the, the, the father was not the custodial father, and so he didn't have standing in court, and so therefore the Supreme Court kicked the case out, and so it's unresolved. But since it's not been found unconstitutional, it's not unconstitutional. It's deemed by the Supreme Court and ruled on it. Anyway, I don't know what Bart says. <laughs> Throw that one in there for you. Yeah, apparently he must have done the Pledge of Allegiance in a different manner, adding different words. Bart. All right, now let's turn our attention to John Foster Dulles, Secretary of State. We've talked about him before under Dwight Eisenhower, who was president during much of the 1950s. The theme there is um, this new look policy, okay? The new look policy. This is kind of interesting. As we look at the United States, um, how we're going to handle the different challenges that come up in the 1950s, right? So we had Eisenhower, right? He had been you know, Supreme Commander of the forces, the Allied forces in, in Europe during uh, World War II. And, you know, it took a huge amount of money and people to build the kind of uh, military capability to win World War II. And of course, we've got all of these soldiers now, you know, when he campaigned, the Eisenhower campaign in 1952 was like, I'm going to go to Korea. I'm going to go to Korea and I'm going to, you know, get this thing resolved. And he ultimately did, you know, stalemate and, you know, armistice. You guys stay over there, we'll stay here. But I mean, there was like lots and lots and lots of various different um, soldiers and money and so forth. An interesting idea starts popping up in the 1950s. It's called the New Look Policy. Um, and it's advanced by Eisenhower and John Foster Dulles. And, you know, it's this kind of idea that, well, maybe we can like get our strategic objectives on the cheap. In other words, we don't necessarily have to build a big, huge, massive military arsenal because we got nukes. And we could influence the Soviets to like not do things. It's also, remember, we refer to this at the beginning of this unit. It's called brinksmanship, right? There's the word, brinksmanship, okay? Um, the idea is massive retaliation. You mess up, Soviets. We're going to massively retaliate against you. Now, of course, you can see an obvious problem with the idea of massive retaliation and more bang for the buck by putting our, our resources into you know, nuclear weapons and so forth. You know, why build a big army if you can drop 100 bombs and that takes care of it? Or maybe, I don't know, 50 bombs or I don't know, maybe 20 bombs will take care of it. Well, you can see the obvious problem, right? Soviets are doing the same thing. And if you get to a point where both sides are resorting to the use of nuclear weapons, you know, who wins that war? Who's gonna win that war? And, and, and eventually it's gonna become ridiculous after we've already seen this, the development on both sides of intercontinental ballistic missiles that can launch each other, nuclear weapons, nothing left with the roaches, the radioactive roaches after that kind of thing. So anyway, though the idea came up, during the 1950s, and it was part of the policy, eventually there will be some pulling back, and there will be, on the part of the Soviets and the United States, in addition to a lot of money going into nuclear weaponry, there will be a lot of money going into traditional conventional weaponry, because when, say, when we fight, you know, we saw it during the Korean War, did we use our nukes? Because if we used our nukes, it could be World War III. Are we going to use our nukes in uh, the Vietnam War? Because if we use our nukes or hit the Soviets or, or, or the Chinese communists and so forth, it could be World War III. So there's going to be a lot of conventional warfare going on there. Um, yeah, there we go. Massive retaliation. 
That was the idea. Brinksmanship. It's a little bit too dangerous. Eventually, we'll settle into, and you'll hear more about it later, a concept we referred to before, mutual assured destruction, right? Both sides have the capability of surviving a nuclear assault in order to launch another nuclear assault. So maybe we shouldn't launch nuclear assaults. Maybe we should actually try and not have that conflict between the Soviets and the United States directly, okay? Instead of playing, you know, chicken on a, on a road and who's gonna blink? Um, having said that though, <laughs> let's get some of the details of our capability, right? We have the Strategic Air Command, SAC, right? Strategic Air Command, has, you know, it's got jets and fighters and so forth, but mostly what we're looking at is um, at the early stages, B-47s and then B-52s. We introduced the B-52s, I believe, earlier. These are long-range bombers, especially B-52. So they can be launched from uh, U.S. bases, for example, in the United States or also in some of our allied countries and get to the Soviet Union and back, deliver an arsenal and back. Soviets have the same kind of things in theirs. Okay, but an interesting idea comes up though, and that is you, you have these, this sense, and we saw it during the Hungarian situation and all these thick conflicts going in East Europe and, and Berlin, spheres of influence. Okay, the Soviets are there, let's not hit them directly because that could World War III. So we get this various push and pull over what are the spheres of influence. The spheres of influence seeing the United States and be like, okay, in Eastern Europe, Soviets, except for like East Berlin and of course, excuse me, West Berlin and our allies there. Um, but in some of the other areas, you start getting some really interesting things. This is just a real quick look at how things are gonna play out. Um, the next unit, we'll be looking at so the Vietnam War, um, how France had control of Southeast Asia, parts of Southeast Asia, they were colonies, but France will, after World War II, ultimately decide to give them up. Although, <laughs> it's gonna take a while. It's not right after World War II. In fact, right here, do you see Dien Bien Phu? It's a massive French military defeat in 1954 because there's a lot of nationalists, Vietnamese and other nationalists that are like, France, you should leave, we're gonna fight you. <laughs> and they defeated them and France left in 1954. But here's the problem, these nationalists, <clears throat> particularly in the North there, are supplied and supported by communists, Soviet Union in particular. And that's gonna be a real big problem, all right? So we're going to, I don't know, when the French leave, who's gonna step into the position of a fighting communist in Southeast Asia? Yeah, the United States, the Vietnam War. Okay, we'll get all the details of that. That's where we say, that's a sphere of influence because we don't want to lose that because then we could lose this and then we could lose that. It's like a domino theory. The next thing we know, Australia and New Zealand are gonna be under the Soviet control and so forth. Well, it takes a particular attention. Let's turn back to the Americas. Let's turn our attention back to the Americas because in the particulars here, the United States is really, really interested in not having American states and when I mean American, I mean Central America and South America. We're not interested in them going communist, going Soviet. Okay, and so we've got the CIA keeping a close eye and observing and sometimes getting involved in various particular types of things. And eventually later on, people are like, really? They were doing that? That was awfully secret. Hmm. So for example, let's get to the details. Um, Guatemala, South of Mexico. Okay, Guatemala. They had an election. 1954, Jacobo Arbenz, Jacobo Arbenz, you guys have that one too. And uh, he's elected. And the CIA is like, I don't know about this guy. He seems awfully left. What do we know about him? What's the status say? Oh, he's a leftist. Ooh, we admire Stalin. Mm, that's not a real good thing for, that could be bad. That could be very bad. Um, I mean, like, what kinds of things could he possibly do that would really like, create consternation among out of America. Well, what Americans do have interests in Guatemala? Well, Chiquita, the United Fruit Company, remember that? The United Fruit Company, they own a lot of land. They produce a lot of um, agricultural products, uh, bananas and so forth. <laughs> and they're on friendly terms with the previous government. I mean, like, what could our Benz do that would really upset them? Nationalize the land, land reform, take the land away from 
United Food Company or like pay them pennies on the dollar or something to get that lamb. Well, the United Food Company is going to send a message to the CIA and the CIA looks at our bands and goes, this guy is just too dangerous. And so ultimately, I don't know, we're going to like have people write letters in the next election or we're we just going to take care of this a little bit quicker. Well, as it turns out in 1954, uh, here we go. No, in 1957, excuse me, 1954, our Benz is overthrown. Boom. Military coup. The military it happens sometimes, actually happens frequently, <laughs> where the United States gets involved in Latin American history. The military comes in because, you know, it's like, well, we're afraid of this and afraid of that, and how we don't want this to go that and so forth. And so here you have, this is actually critical. You can tell this is critical, right? Here's the new leader, uh, Colonel, <laughs> Carlos Castillo Armas, with a handshake from, recognize him, the U.S. Secretary, John Foster Dulles. Oh, and there's the nuke. <laughs> so it looks like Eisenhower's face on it, or bombs at least. And so, yeah, we, we start to see a pattern developing here. Um, Armas, ultimately assassinated as president in 1957, but nevertheless, the United States coming in on the side of folks who tend to be in support of U.S. interests, and sometimes those U.S. interests are like tied in with the economic interests. This is why sometimes you hear references to Latin American countries, particularly in Central America, as being banana republics. It's not a store in the mall, although it is a store in the mall. But what they're really referring to, a banana republic, is a... Mm, uh, a government that is very much under the influence of U.S. Uh, military and economic interests. Um, you have a very stratified society, a lot of poor on the bottom, and some very, very wealthy. And of course, in the midst of this Cold War, uh, there is concern. The United States is saying basically to the Soviets, we don't want you, we don't want your thinking, we don't like the communists and so forth. I mean, what? I mean, if the communists actually got, a, got control and the Soviets were actually providing military support to Latin American countries, would that get our attention? Yes. Cuba, it's gonna be a big, big flashpoint. Nicaragua, later on in the 1980s, is gonna be another big flashpoint in the Cold War. Keep an eye on those. We'll be talking about those more as we go along here. The United States is like, I mean, it's the old, what is it? The, the, the Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt corollary to the, Monroe Doctrine. Oh my gosh, the Monroe Doctrine, going all the way back to the 1800s. Basically, the message there was, hey, rest of the world, stay out of the Americas. We want the Americas to be for the Americas, or at least friendly to the United States of America. Okay, so that's the Roosevelt Corollary. Keep those influences out, okay? We'll focus on that as we go along. Now, let's turn our attention to Canada, Mexico, and Brazil, all right? First, Canada. What's the scoop in Canada during the Cold War, at least this stage? Um, Canada, of course, came out of World War II having made major contributions, certainly for a country that size. It actually had, what, one million men in service. Um, they had the third largest surface fleet in the world at that time and the fourth largest air force, right? Um, and they're going to be very involved with a lot of these things we talked about already. So, for example, the Berlin Airlift. Were the Canadians involved helping out there? Yep. NATO. Yep, they're in NATO. Um, are they going to be involved in the Korean War uh, with peacekeeping uh, forces uh, allied with the United Nations? Yep, they're going to be in there too. Um, yeah, <laughs> they're going to have uh, their troops stationed in uh, West Germany, in the Black Forest region and so forth. Um, yeah, there are key, uh, here, here's your prime minister, um, Saint Laurent, from 1948 to 1957, very, very close with the United States on things. I mean, they're a separate country, but for much of this particular time period, there's going to be a lot of alignment on the way things look. So, for example, here, NORAD. I mean, that's probably one of the best examples of alignment. NORAD, North American Aerospace Defense Command, right, created in 1958. This is part of a joint effort between the United States and Canada to um, keep an eye on what? The North Pole? What, like what's coming from the North Pole? Oh, perhaps Soviet long range aircraft coming from the other side of the North Pole, right? And that's the way it works. If you look at the map, the shortest route from the United States to the Soviet Union is over the North Pole through Canada. So Canada, 
has like early warning detection systems and so forth, operating in close cooperation with the United States. I mean, it's NORAD, it's, it's a joint effort. Um, so if the Soviets ultimately do launch planes or later on, if there was a launch of uh, long range missiles, ICBMs, uh, NORAD would be able to detect it. They've got eyes on the sky looking at anything that potentially could be coming in. I mean, it's like, and particularly at a time of year, there is like a great deal of sensitivity. In fact, there's Americans, young Americans, tuning in all over the place to see what's coming in from the north. <laughs> you can actually track Santa Claus on NORAD. <laughs> so sweet. He's going to drop something for you. He's going to come into your house and deliver goods if you're good. So be on the right side. You know, don't be naughty, be nice. Wait a minute, he's wearing red. <laughs> he's no, he's not a communist. He gives stuff away. Where does he get it from? Anyway, whatever. NORAD. <laughs> they actually do track. You can, you can look at, at that. Okay. What about communists and so forth? Um, was there a concern about, um, you know, communist influence in the Canadian government and so forth? There was a bit of a red scare in Canada as well, just like in the United States in the early Cold War time period. Okay, now Joseph McCarthy was a United States senator and so forth. But there was concern what was going on in Canada. And there was like efforts to uh, crack down on, you know, you know, keeping an eye on the labor union so that they are you know, like advocating for the workers, but not like trying to be influenced and infiltrated by, you know, Soviet uh, agents and so forth. Eventually, though, just like in the United States, that hysteria will calm down a bit. And in particular, it was interesting, in particular in Canada, they really didn't like how the United States uh, Senate. Uh, was conducting its affairs in the area of, you know, this, uh, you know, like finding out, you know, the influence of the Reds. Prime example had to do with Ambassador E. Herbert Norman. He was a Canadian ambassador to Egypt, okay, 1957. Canadians were upset because um, his name had come out publicly in a United States Senate subcommittee, and there was questioning of the loyalty of the Canadian ambassador, Norman, and the Canadians are like, what? Are you kidding? This was like highly classified, sensitive information, and it, it doesn't even say what you're saying it says. And this, they were really mad. They were like, man, we're not gonna share our top security information with you if you got a bunch of subcommittee senators or staffers that are just gonna be like using it for political purposes and so forth. I mean, like what's the worst thing that can happen when a you know, Canadian ambassador has his you know, loyalty questioned by you know, a United States Senate subcommittee? And he takes his own life. Yeah, in 1957, he took his own life and the Canadians were not happy about the US role in that. Okay, we'll keep an eye on Canada as we continue through the Cold War, um, mostly aligned with the United States interests and so forth. Probably the best example, like, you know, NORAD. There we go. Um, but other times, you know, they're a separate country. Okay, they have separate elections and they don't like it when things get too crazy in the United States, as was the case in this particular thing. Okay, all right, now let's look at Mexico, just to the south. Mexico is a fascinating one. We know that relationship between the United States and Mexico is tense, you know, going way back to the Mexican-American War and World War I, when the Mexicans are like, I don't know, maybe we could, but that would be really stupid to go to war with the United States, even if Zimmerman is going, hey, come on, whatever, you can have you know, California and Texas and a whole bunch of other things back. No. Mexico is interesting. Here's what you need to know about Mexico during this, particularly during this early Cold War stage. There are no Marxist revolutions going on in Mexico, okay? They're not gonna take place there, all right? Now they don't have anti-communist dictators like you see in some places like in Brazil or Chile or Argentina and so forth. So you're not gonna see like, you know, this far right element. But at the same time, you have like no major civil conflicts taking place that are gonna turn into wars like occurred in Central America, Nicaragua and so forth. In a sense, it's gonna be very, very stable. And it all has to do with the PRI. It is the one dominant political party. And that creates a lot of stability 
It tends to take issues and kind of sweep them under the rugs. Inflexibility, when we catch up to it in the 1960s, particularly in 1968, you're gonna have a lot of students going, man, this is not so good, protests and so forth. Um, and so Mexico is interesting. The Mexican leadership, like for example, these two leaders right here, um, President Miguel Alman, 1946, 1952, and then Cortinas, 1952, 1958. Um, they're allied with the United States, but it's almost like if you're going to be a Mexican politician, you don't want to like really say, hey, we really get along great with the United States of America, because there already is that feeling that in Mexico over a long period of time that the United States has been a little bit too dominant. But at the same time, the Mexican leadership doesn't want to raise the concern of the United States so that it feels like it would want to involve itself. So they tend to support the United States quietly, like Elman curtails labor and independence, right? You know, the PRI wants to be in charge of like keeping an eye on who the labor unions are and what they're doing. Um, so you're not going to see, you know, left, leftist goals and communist goals develop within the labor movement. And then Cortinas and so forth, when the United States was getting involved in Guatemala and helping through the CIA to overthrow um, an elected leader, Mexicans keep their um, concerns limited uh, during that time period when the United States is backing a military coup in Guatemala. An interesting thing actually does take place in Mexico during the early Cold War and into the mid-Cold War time period, and sometimes referred to as the economic miracle. Uh, the government is going to invest heavily in energy and transportation, agriculture. Um, you see uh, urban populations growing uh, rapidly during that time period. Um, during the 1950s and into the 60s, you see like about a, roughly a 7% growth rate, um, which is very, very interesting. Um, so as you get continued uh, manufacturing growth, obviously you got all kinds of markets in other parts of the world, including the United States going on there. And of course, they're selling lots of oil. I mean, hey, you know, if you're an oil rich country, that can help your economy. Although other people would say mm, there are certain limitations. For example, um, if your government has like a very uh, much a protectionist policy, like for example, in communications, there is a monopoly, uh, there was, I believe there still is, a monopoly on uh, communication. So, you know, telephone. In the United States, got all kinds of various different telephone options and so forth. In Mexico, 90% of all the telephones were operated by Telmex. Telmex, the man in charge, Carlos Slim, was like the number one uh, richest guy in the world, even more than Bill Gates, if you can believe that. Um, so, sometimes that um, can constrict economic development because if you have just one source of communications and so forth, they get to set the price and sometimes those prices are highly uh, inflated and tend to constrict um, economic growth opportunities within the country. So anyway, you, you've got a one-party system, you've got one telephone, and anyway, so some limitations. We'll keep an eye on Mexico as we go along. Last country, Brazil. So what have we got to say about Brazil? This is very interesting. The United States is sort of like, what's going on with Brazil? I mean, it's ultimately Brazil is like the biggest economy now in the Americas next to the United States. I mean, they're certainly growing very, very fast. Um, they were an ally, World War II, we saw that, right? The Cobras Fermantes. Um, and they were under the leadership of Vargas right here, Cachulio Vargas. Although people were like, you know, is he really leaning to the right wingers and so forth? Obviously, he didn't ally himself with the right wingers, but there was a, a, a concern about that. Probably the one thing that got the United States a little bit concerned about Vargas was he's very much a nationalist, right? He wasn't really interested in foreign investment, U.S. investment, other countries investing in the natural resources and economic development of, of Brazil. Why would he be concerned? Well, perhaps he didn't want outsiders controlling too much and then kind of bossing around. Remember when, when we did the Mexican Revolution uh, unit and there was concern that the United States interests control like most of the Mexican economy? So here's um, Vargas taking, a, taking the side of limiting U.S. influence in the Brazilian economy. Well, he's followed by Eureka Gaspar Dutra. I'm sure I'm messing up the pronunciation on that. And he was president in 1946, 1951. Well, let's see, what, what do you suppose? How much can you read in the picture? Is this, this like a friendly handshake with US President Truman? 
or is this uh, indicative of an improved relationship where maybe Brazil is going to be more open to foreign investment, U.S. investment, and so forth? Yep. Yeah, he's going to be more open to that. So the United States investment is like, yeah, let's get involved in mining and you know all kinds of various different agricultural things. Um, and of course, Truman's happy because uh, Dutra outlaws the Brazilian Communist Party. And so he really likes that. Although in the, Bra the Brazilians are like, well, I don't know, is there too much you know, Western uh, US influence and so forth? I don't know where they're gonna, yep, they do. They bring back Vargas. Vargas is elected in 1951 and he's in there till 1954. Although, you know, he's bringing back economic nationalism, so restrictions on U.S. investments and so forth, but there's other things going on there. Scandals, corruption, conflict with the military, conflict with foreign bankers and so forth. Lots and lots of pressure. There's the headline, 1954, he didn't leave office. He actually takes his own life. That is the end of Vargas. A lot, a lot of pressures. Um, I mean, like, what's gonna happen next? Are you, who are you gonna have coming in next? Uh, Kubitschek, all right? He's in there from 1956 to 1961. Kind of swings it back to the policies of Dutra, open to foreign investment. Um, and so, the, you know, the United States is like, okay, so, I mean, so you have elections at least. You know, you got elections kind of going this way, that way, and so forth. Although the military is keeping a close eye. Are the military going to get involved in politics? Is there ever a point where the military would get involved in politics? What, oh, whoop, oh, oh, 64, yeah, a military coup. And they take, yeah, and when the military comes in to like restore stability in the crazy political election system and so forth, if you oppose them, it's not going to be very good, as this kind of cartoon indicates. It is fascinating because I, you know, I follow the news and there's like, you know, little headlines here and there and so forth. I mean, the coronavirus is big in the news. Hello, but there's also other things going on in the news. I remember seeing something that's like crazy, corrupt Brazilian politics. Is the military going to step in again? I'm like, oh my gosh, really? In Brazil? Again? Well, they did at various different times, including 1964, which is why sometimes folks in Brazil, average folks are like, politics politics, military, whatever. Is there something that we can count on that will just bring us joy in soccer, football, Brazil, Pele. He was awesome. He was a great soccer player. When I was growing up, Pele was awesome. Watching the videos of Pele. I mean, come on, hello. 1958. World Cup winners, 1962, World Cup winners, 1970, World Cup winners, Brazil, Pele, boom, boom. I think they got the uh, the World Cup, what, like four times? They were hosting the World Cup in 2014, and if you, some of you guys may have seen the video of what happened, if you actually watched that, it was a disaster in the semifinals, Brazil's hosting Germany. You know, close matches, what, 1-1, one, 0-0, one, zero, zero, whatever, the, the Germans ended up scoring what, like eight goals to Brazil's one goal. It was like tragic for the Brazilian population. They want to come back. I don't know. It's like, what could happen in Brazil? I mean, they love their soccer and they love it when their soccer teams perform very, very well. And they have some of the best soccer teams out there. Although there's a lot of competition, Argentina, and the European countries, Germany, Spain, France, Italy, take your pick, Netherlands. I mean, they're amazing. Is that it? Oh, that's the next stuff. <laughs> We're going to save that until the fall. Until um, you come back. I'm about to sneeze. Ah, so, hang on. This will wrap up our notes. for this semester, okay? Um, I'll send the uh, essay assessment question coming up here real soon. Yeah, this is better. Um, and uh, yeah, you guys stay safe, stay healthy. And if there's anything you need, get in contact with me. All right, out of here.